It's a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, George Andrews today. Uh, professor Andrews is the uh, Evan Pugh and Evan Pugh Professor at Penn State University. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Math Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as a uh, former president of the American Math Society. He's um, made contributions in analysis, and combinatorics, and number theory, and is particularly well known for his work in Q series and special functions and partitions, which I think will come up today as well. Um, <coughs> he's on his uh, Wikipedia page, he's listed as the world <coughs> expert on partitions, and he certainly is the guy. <laughs> so he's the go-to guy in this course. Um, so, rather than say anything more, I'm going to introduce George. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, it's been a while since I visited uh, NC State, but uh, my past visits have always been very enjoyable. And uh, this one is proving to be equally pleasant. And uh, so I'm always pleased to come to such a friendly place. So this afternoon, I'm going to tell you a bit about the Indian mathematician Ramanujan. I hope to tell you a little bit about some of the excitement and the strange things that both happened to him and that relate to his career. And I also hope not only to show you some of his mathematics, but to, I hope, give you a hint of how uh, one might look at his achievements and try to uh, expand upon them. So the picture you see on the screen is Srinivasa Ramanujan. He is a national hero in India. I'm hearing on a postage stamp that his, uh, his 75th birthday was commemorated uh, with the postage stamp, although the dates of his life are listed on the right hand side of this stamp, 1887 to 1920. So he did not live to uh, who lived, did not live to 33 years of age. He died in his 32nd year. Um, of course, India is rightly proud of him. Uh, he spent time at Cambridge University, as I will discuss with you. And uh, Cambridge is proud of him as well in an ad for their uh, graduate program. Uh, you see Ramanujan here in his best pair of jeans. And, uh, and with, uh, I believe, Alan Turing on the, uh, I think it's Turing on the right, I'm not sure who all it is uh, here, but uh, Newton is right next, to, of course, to Ramanujan, so that you really get an outstanding education at Cambridge University. <laughs> <laughs> Michael mentioned that I had been president of the American Mathematical Society. One of the things that the American Mathematical Society does for you is to create a symbol. And this is my darkest slide, I'm afraid, but I hope you can get a little idea of what the presidential symbol was during my uh, tenure. Uh, so the picture is actually the, the Indian sun is shining over an Indian skyline, and Ramanujan's image is barely visible in the back, looking out at one of the formulas that relate to both what Ramanujan did and things that I have done uh, subsequently to expand upon Ramanujan. Ramanujan was born in southern India in, um, in 1887. He was at from a Brahmin family, which means he was upper caste, but they were a very poor family. So uh, he had diff serious difficulties because of this in life. He was what we would call a 
child prodigy in mathematics. Indeed, if you visit the high school in Kumba Konum, where he went to high school, they still have some of the, the certificates that he won as, in his mathematical achievements in high school. As a result of being good in mathematics, he won a scholarship to the government college in Kumba Konum. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he was not what we like to refer to as a well-rounded student, so that he continued to do well at mathematics, but he did not do well in certain uh, other courses, including the uh, course on English and, I think, a physiology course. And as a result, he lost his scholarship. And in, if we view this as from purely uh, North American terms, we could see this as a sort of the end of a possibly brilliant career. <coughs> He was so obsessed with mathematics that it really did not have much effect on him. And so he basically uh, continued just to work at mathematics and apparently be supported by his family. In 1909, he married and consequently had to get a job, which was basically as a clerk in the Madras, or now Chennai, Port Trust for very little money. And his friends encouraged him to write to English mathematicians with the hope that somebody in England would appreciate how uh, good he was and would offer him assistance. His first two letters went, I believe, to Hobson and Baker. Um, and each of them basically brushed him off. I should add as a side note that having been on the ANOVA program uh, discussing the life of this genius, I was subsequently written to by every mathematical psychopath in North America <laughs> with, the, uh, with the suggestion that if I had somehow in, uh, added to the popularity of this rather pedestrian Indian mathematician, I could really get it big if I just exploited them in a similar program. So I do have more sympathy for the people who brushed off Ramanujan now. <laughs> His third letter went to J.H. Hardy. And with these letters, he included a number of pages of his mathematical work. Fortunately, he included a couple of quite complicated definite integrals that actually Hardy himself had discovered and had published and was rather proud of. And so immediately Hardy realized that here is someone of really genuinely fine mathematical taste. And in addition to these formulas, there were others. Let me just put a couple on the screen for you. Uh, of these, Hardy said, I'm quoting now, I had never seen anything the least like them before. A single look at them is enough to show that they could only be written down by a mathematician of the highest class. They must be true, because if they were not true, no one would have had the imagination to invent them. <laughs> Finally, the writer must be completely honest, because great mathematicians are common than thieves or humbugs of such incredible skill. And so Hardy's response was to write to Ramanujan and urge that he uh, come to England and that they collaborate. So there were various family and religious objections to this, but they were eventually overcome. And in 1914, Ramanujan arrived in England for what was really a historic collaboration with G.H. Hardy. During the period of time that he was in England, one of the papers he wrote, wrote they two wrote together, is the foundation of the modern uh, subject of probabilistic number theory. The paper that they wrote on what is called the partition function was the first paper that settled what has been called the subsequently the Hardy-Littlewood method, 
but or the circle method, but it has its origin in this joint work with Hardy and Ramanujan. His work on modular forms, in particular his work related to what is called Ramanujan's tau function, uh, set up conjectures that lasted for much of the 20th century, and indeed the solution of one of them by Pierre Deligne was the the central component in the uh, Fields Medal that Deligne received. Unfortunately, after two or three years in England, he contracted a disease which was diagnosed as tuberculosis. There is all sorts of speculation that has gone on for years as to whether it really was tuberculosis. Uh, there is a belief that it may have been a vitamin deficiency, that it may have been some sort of uh, bacteria, bacterial or amoebic infection. In any event, he became very ill and sort of convalesced in England for a, more than a year. Uh, in early 1919, he seemed to get a little better. So he was thought that maybe if he returned to his home country, he would uh, be able to recover. So he returned to India in 1919, but unfortunately his health got worse, and he died in April of 1920. When he was in uh, India in the last year of his life, he sent a letter to G.H. Hardy which reads as follows, I, probably it's harder for you to, at least those of you, those of you in the back of my eyesight would have a hard time with this, so let me tell you what's being said here. I'm extremely sorry for not writing you a single letter up to now. I discovered very interesting functions recently, which I call mock theta functions. Unlike the false theta functions, studied partially by Professor Rogers in his interesting paper, they enter into mathematics as beautifully as the ordinary theta functions, and I'm sending you with this letter some examples. And uh, later <coughs> on in the letter, he lists what he calls log theta functions. So um, it, there is a, a lot of, uh, so there, there are the ellipsis dot 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 right there. So there are about four pages between those three dots and <laughs> the log theta functions in which he really lays out at length what he is talking about. So let me try to succinctly describe the idea. The classical theta functions studied by Jacobi are of immense use in a variety of applications stretching from the partial differential equation related to heat to various problems in number theory and so they have played a significant role in mathematics. And part of the, the quality of these functions is that their behavior, their asymptotic behavior near the unit circle, if you think of them as functions of a complex variable, is very accurately determined by the fact that they behave very well under transformations of the variable related to what is called the modular group. I don't want to go into great detail on that except to communicate to you that these classical functions had extremely, unbelievably nice qualities as analytic functions and consequently were extremely useful in applications both in pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Ramanujan's idea was maybe there is a larger class of functions that has this extremely nice these nice analytic qualities like the theta functions, but, was, but are not the classic theta functions, but really something that has gone beyond them. And this is what he is getting at in this letter. So this is a project that he obviously thinks is important. As Hardy was to say later, there, he doesn't say a word in this letter about his health. He's only talking mathematics. Indeed, this is the op opening line of the letter. And so the, the fact that three months later he was dead came as a real shock to Hardy because it seemed like he was operating at least in, in, in full efficiency intellectually. So 
how in the world did I get involved in this? Well, when I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, my thesis advisor, the late Hans Rademacher, was uh, the, uh, I would definitely have called him the world's leading expert on partitions, but he was also uh, fascinated with Ramanujan and with Ramanujan's mathematics. And in particular, he thought that the mathematics described in this last letter about mock data functions was very interesting because Ramanujan stated a number of formulas and proved none of them. And he had given as a problem to a previous graduate student, Lila Dragonette, the problem of following up on one of Ramanujan's assertions. And she had gone a certain distance in proving what Ramanujan was saying. And Hans Rademacher thought that one could get a good deal farther. And that formed the basis of my uh, thesis. And so I became the world's leading expert, at least, on mock data functions, because nobody else in the world at that time, while a dragonette had moved on to other things and had left academia, so that no one was doing anything or looking at mock data functions. <clears throat> so uh, I then went to, uh, to Penn State University as an assistant professor, and after first six years, I uh, was up for a sabbatical, and I wrote to Lucy Slater in Cambridge, who had been a student of W.N. Bailey, who had been in Cambridge when Ramanujan was there, and had written many papers on Ramanujan, and so had Lucy Slater. And I suggested that I might be interested in coming to Cambridge. So I won't read this entire letter to you, which she wrote to me in 1970, only to say that she was telling me that <clears throat> there were a number of things of interest in the Trinity College Library, and in particular, some um, manuscripts that, uh, that were um, put together by, uh, by um, uh, G.N. Watson, and she laid in the letter, um, tells me that they are kept. These papers are kept at the Trinity College Library in uh, Cambridge. Well, the birth of my first child and a variety of other things prevented me from going to, uh, to Cambridge then. But for my next sabbatical, I wrote uh, back to Lucy Slater, and she uh, <coughs> told her that I about reminded her of this box of materials that Jan Watson had, and also that I was still, still interested in examining some of the other papers that she had in her possession. Well, after a long uh, period of time there, seemingly long, uh, the, that sabbatical worked out, and in the spring of 1976, I visited the Trinity College Library to look at these boxes of materials that were held by, uh, that had been contributed from the estate of G.N. Watson, who was one of the English analysts, contemporaneous more or less with G.H. Hardy, and who had studied uh, Ramanujan's mathematics uh, in the 1920s and 30s. And in opening one of the boxes of these letters, there was a manuscript, about 140 pages on 100 sheets of paper, so some of the pages were written on both sides, and all of it was in Ramanujan's handwriting. And it was formula after formula. And uh, how, did I, how would I recognize Ramanujan's handwriting? The answer to that is that before Ramanujan went to England, he copied in books the formulas that he discovered and carried around these notebooks. And the Tata Institute in the mid-1950s published photostatic reproductions of his notebooks so that anybody interested in this area, like I was, would have looked at these notebooks and seen this special handwriting and this special way of recording formulas. And here it was, again, in the Watson box. But even more interesting than that, 
I will show you some pages of what it looks like. The page of Ramanujan's mathematics from the Lost Notebooks looks something like this. Well, there are some disorganized pages on which, which are really just scratch notes, but then or, this is an example of an organized page, and you see that, that the use of the English language is somewhat constrained here. <laughs> Here's the word if, and, and, and then, if, and then, and that, this is a fairly wordy page for you. <laughs> so, you, furthermore, the various formulas that he writes down in succession, sometimes they're related to one another, sometimes they aren't, and so the, the formulas that appear at the bottom of the page are actually related to one another. The ones at the top of the page are not related to the ones at the bottom of the page, and this is a standard process throughout this. So here I am still looking at this document. Fortunately, as I mentioned for you earlier, I was the only person in the world who actually knew anything about mock theta functions. The phrase mock theta function does not appear in this manuscript but if you know what the mock data functions are, you see that the mock data functions are all in this manuscript. Furthermore, in the 1930s, Jan Watson wrote two papers on the mock data functions based not on this manuscript, but on the letter that Hardy, that Hardy received from Ramanujan. He, the first paper was his retiring presidential address as president of the London Math Society and deals with what Ramanujan called third order mock theta functions. And he is able really to lay out how it is that they transform under the modular group the way classical theta functions transform under the modular group. In a second paper, he writes on what Ramanujan called his fifth order mock theta functions. And this is a much more uh, subdued paper in which Watson says that the formulas that I was able to come up with to give this structure in the first paper, it, I cannot find comparable uh, results for the fifth order functions and I'm beginning to doubt that such results exist. So, to my great surprise, here in this manuscript are, is everything that Ramanujan left out of his letter to Hardy, all the things that, that Watson discovered about the third order mock theta functions, but in addition, the formulas that Watson conjectured did not exist are all listed in this manuscript, so that you have clearly that, that Ramanujan saw much farther and much more clearly what was going on here than he indicated in his letter to Hardy and that Watson was able to figure out studying the letter to Hardy. So uh, that has produced a, uh, a sequence of almost, uh, well, several decades of on and off study of the lost notebook. I should say that the mathematics unit has not only been studied by me, but by many other people, and the applications of it and the implications of the lost notebook, especially the work on my, my theta functions, is only really coming to be appreciated today. So what I want to do next is to give you some feeling for the type of formulas that one finds in the uh, Lost Notebook. And so I want to um, present a few sort of, what, this is sort of a, a tutorial. So it's not, it's not really, um, I want to do something sufficiently elementary, but also something to convey the element of surprise so let me put up two or three series. 
that um, I see a thing, a little blocks there. So there are three series uh, very much like the formulas that you will see in the Lost Notebook. You often see formulas in which there are these binary factors, one plus maybe, or one minus q to an integer power, and generally you will have a very natural progression of powers like 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n here, or here you have the sequence of the odd numbers of the 2n plus 1, or here you have plus signs with the same sort of factors that you had there. The reason that I put this up and the surprise I want to indicate is these functions do look somewhat closely related to one another, but in fact they are not, they are actual constants. So if you expand them in a power series, the first one's equal to 1, the second one's equal to 2, and the third one's equal to 3. Uh, so uh, the, of course, the joke that goes with this is that this is as simple as 1, 2, 3. And of course, that explains why I added 1 to each thing. Because then it's as simple as 0, 1, 2. Uh, <laughs> uh, here, for example, is one of the pages. So in, at the 100th birthday of Ramanujan, the, the Narosa Press printed uh, photostatic copies of all the pages from the lost notebook. And here is the way one of the pages starts out with five formulas. And let me show you, I think in more detail, you can see this. I actually have five formulas on the screen and I can almost get them on. I guess I will have to move shift this up and down at times. Anyway. These are the left-hand sides of the series that you just saw. Ramanujan seldom uses capital sigma notation. He does use it, use it, but not often. So he writes out three terms and then a dot, dot, dot at the end. And since nothing ever is more than a quadratic sequence, having three terms of a quadratic sequence means you should be able to figure out everything. So that here, you have q to the 0, q squared, q to the 6. So in the nth term, this will be q to the n times n plus 1. Uh, most everything else here it goes up linearly, so that everything is indeed overdetermined. And what turns out here is that if you look at the left-hand side, it, and expand it in a power series, it becomes this very simple series, a series much like one studied by Gauss. It's an alternating series, and the exponents are the familiar triangular numbers, n times n plus 1 over 2. So 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 35, etc. Um, and that's the first thing. I would want to show you that the variations in the left-hand side are, um, well, things change a bit. Uh, as you see, the different exponents on Q here in the numerator terms are now squared, whereas it does have the same denominator. In the third line, the denominator is still the same, but now the exponents in the numerator go up by the odd powers and so on. There are these slight changes as you go from line to line. But one would never expect that. The first equation, if we call it f of q, the second equation is f of q squared. The third equation is f of q cubed. <coughs> fourth equation is f of q to the fourth. And for the $64 question, the fifth equation <laughs> so you see, this is, if you look at the left hand sides of this, you see nothing that suggests this tight interrelationship. In other words, the idea that to move from one line to the next, you just replace Q by a higher power of Q. This is not in any way visible in the things that you see on the left hand side. 
So this is the thing that one takes away if this is not your main area of research. If it is related to your main area of research, you'll take away something different when you try to prove these. So if you're really an expert on this sort of stuff, the top line will take you about 10 minutes. Something like that. It's not that hard. Lines two and four, a little harder. Took me probably half an hour. Lines three and five took me several months. <laughs> Yet, there isn't anything you can see in this list that suggests that any one of them is deeper than any of the others. They all seem very similar, very much the same. And this is the sort of thing that, this is just an example of the sort of thing that pops up all the time in studying Ramanujan's work. There are other aspects of the surprise of his work. Um, it took you several months already knowing the answers that he had written yes, in the Yes, yes, yes. It took me several months already knowing the answer. Um, <laughs> back to a form a page that I showed you earlier just as an example and let me draw attention to the things that you see at the bottom of the page. So they don't look any uh, more odd than the sorts of things that you just saw, but they look extremely odd to me because you see that in this f of a q, he has now introduced, these are not binary terms that you saw in the five examples that I just showed you. They are ternary expressions. And worse than that, in these infinite products, you see ternary expressions where, which is quadratic in these variables a and b. In other words, no one working in this area studies formulas that look like this. They, indeed, the only way that these have actually been proved is to first reduce them to the sorts of series that you just saw. And now this raises one natural question that I want to pose, and that is, why did he write them in this way? So when he sent those two formulas that Hardy said I had never seen anything like them before. They actually, those formulas are actually corollaries of a corollary of something that's rather more straightforward, although uh, still something that Hardy was unable to prove. But Ramanujan did not send the, the top stuff to Hardy initially, only these formulas that you saw that so impressed Hardy and he had no idea how to prove them. Littlewood said he's probably keeping things up his sleeve because he's afraid you'll steal his results. So one could always conjecture, well, he writes things in an odd way because he doesn't want anybody to steal his results. But, but that is, that's a reasonable enough thing to say for a young Indian writing to the British imperialists uh, to, about his own mathematics. These are his private notes. There's no plan on his part to publish anything here. So you might keep something from the British, but you're not going to keep anything from yourself. So for some reason or another, this is what he thought was the sensible way of doing things. And uh, it, uh, the, way, the way that one approaches this, for example, it, let me just show you how to resolve things. The key to the first identity lies in this assertion that a squared plus b squared equals 4. So those of us even who weren't all that good in trigonometry, trigonometry realize that you can parameterize that and as a result the a squared b squared minus 2 that appeared in that infinite product actually resolves itself into another cosine. And once you've done that, then I say the rest is Watson's formula and partial fractions. In other words, once you make this observation and this change of variable, then everything makes sense. But that's, it makes sense to me. Maybe it made sense to him in some other uh, special way. The last formula that he dealt with had that 
that uh, requirement a squared plus ab plus b squared equals 3. And so now you have to parameterize it with a different set of sines and cosines so that uh, eventually what you will wind up with is that when he shows this formula, this expression in his infinite product, it turns out also to be a cosine. And once you recall that cosines are, can be rewritten in terms of e to the i theta, then expressions like this split into binary factors, and now everything is back in the world that more, uh, the lesser mortals actually understand. But it still is a mystery as to why he would think of the mathematics that he did in those particular ways. So, um, one of the things that uh, the most recent project that I've been involved with is a joint project with Bruce Barron at the University of Illinois to bring out full proofs of everything that exists in the Lost Notebook. So we have in print from Schwinger four volumes, Ramanujan's Lost Notebook, part one, part two, part three, and part four, several hundred pages in each volume, and this is all trying to explain the mathematics in this 135 pages that Ramanujan left after at, on his deathbed. So what I want to do is to show you a little bit of how one might look at some of the things Ramanujan discovered, and think about how one might go about finding out other things. So this will just, this is only sort of an indication of the way one studies, one of the ways one studies the work that you find in the Lost Notebook. So the first thing I want to show you is certain quadratic sequences. So these sequences uh, are going to appear on the next few slides, so you don't have to memorize them. All I want you to recognize is that when you see uh, various powers of Q arising like this, you know that there is a, a quadratic that is that, that explains of these exponents. So theorems like of this nature actually go back to Euler. Uh, in particular, Euler found this, this series as generating the function p of n. p of n is the number of partitions of n. A partition of an integer is just a decomposition of it into a sum of positive integers so that, for example, there are five partitions of 4, 4, 3 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 1 plus 1, and 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Five partitions of 4. And Euler found both all of the expressions that you see on this page, and thus found a, a valuable generating function for p of n, the number of partitions of n. And here you see this one of these sequences, these are called the pentagonal numbers, that occurred in uh, Euler's work. So there is a formula that Ramanujan, uh, or there are a number of formulas that Ramanujan found, and I want to show you just two or three of them. Uh, so these have all been published in volume one of our uh, the joint work with Professor Rick Barron. <clears throat> so here is a series where now again we see the pentagonal numbers, but the signs, S-I-G-N-S, in this series are different from those that Euler found. What Euler found would be one minus minus plus plus minus minus plus plus, whereas here you see four pluses in a row, then four minuses, and four pluses. So Ramanujan found this formula. Um, he also found a similar <coughs> formula where now the, in the previous formula there were even exponents in the denominator. Now there are odd exponents climbing in the numerator. 
and this comes out to be one of these other quadratic sequences that you saw. And to give you a third one, just to set up where I'm actually going, uh, there, this uh, is another example. Now we're back to things in the denominator. There are now instead of even exponents in the denominator, there are odd exponents. Of, and uh, again, you get one of these sequences that I showed you earlier. So, what I'm going to do is to, well, I think that I, so, I'm going to do a computer demonstration of a search that one might do looking at a bunch of things that looked like what Ramanujan had. So I want to show you just some of my, the, the things that you will see on the screen, the computer screen that are rather smaller than what you will see here. And I want, so hopefully you'll be able to see precisely where all the variables are involved. So computers low, people to write linearly. And so this product is PQ stands for the Q Pockhammer symbol. But that's why I use this. But this is to be this finite product. And you will see on the computer screen this expression, which will we, I will ask for the Taylor series expansion in Q out to the power Q to the n. And for the demonstration, I will only go out <coughs> to Q to the 40th power. And we will look at finite products in the numerator and the denominator where the, the increasing power of Q is just Q to the J as J goes from 0 to infinity. So if you expand this actually out in the way uh, Ramanujan wrote it, this expression here is we're actually finding a Taylor series expansion of this uh, expression. So now I want to bring up uh, maxima. <coughs> Computer demonstrations in front of the audience always terrify me. <laughs> uh, now I have on the screen what I want, so let me see. I successful in going to bring Okay. So what you see on the screen there is exactly what I showed you earlier. Uh, and it is basically this this is a this expression includes in it all of the examples you just saw from Ramanuj and Bloch's notebook. So I'm going to so there are these four parameters, A, B, C, and D. N is the length of the Taylor series, so I'm going to take that N is going to go to 40. But A, B, C, and D, I don't want to run a whole long experiment here to get too many examples, so I'm going to let A run from minus 1 to 1, and C run from minus 1 to 1, and B and D either be 1 or 2. That will give 36 different things and will give you some flavor of things. In particular, everything that Ramanujan discovered will, should come up on the screen. I have, at one time before, I did this demonstration, and when I hit return, nothing happened. Ah, okay. So now the computer is, is look, working through all of these things, and as it has, it goes on and on here, it will be done shortly, is done shortly. Let us go back and see what sorts of things happen. Well, uh, there are some series that are reasonably nice looking. Why goodness, here in the middle of the screen is the series with the actual triangular numbers in it. And right at the top of the screen, I guess you do see my entire, the, my entire picture here. So, uh, so at the top of the screen, you see one of the other things that, that Ramanujan had, and, and so on. So the question is, is there anything new here that Ramanujan didn't get? So 
but we've seen many things, and they are, at first glance, we come up with three or four things that are not exactly what he had, but let's see if I can get to one that is particularly disturbing. Uh, one, one, minus one, one. Here's one that is particularly disturbing. So look at the top of the screen here. This series goes, the exponents go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you don't have to be all that quick to see that all the integers appear in this series. And this is very reminiscent of the geometric series. If all the signs were plus, this would be the classic geometric series, which would be 1 over 1 minus q. In other words, we would have found something that has been known <coughs> since time immemorial. But this is not the classic geometric series. Indeed, it is really kind of crazy because these minus signs seem to just sort of kick around in strange places. In other words, there are two of them between 4 and 5, and then there's minus, minus, then they start to alternate, and then on they go, and eventually there are two more between 24 and 25, and so on. But quite clearly, and I, I, if I wanted to, I would carry this out to two or three hundred terms, the same sort of non-pattern goes on in that you'll see always the powers of Q. Uh, but uh, but the uh, <clears throat> real question is, what's happened? So I want to say just a couple of things, and then I will uh, sort of ease into the question and answer period. Uh, one of the things that I did say is that I would uh, perhaps tell some stories about things that are not quite mathematical that have happened as a result of these studies. And I clearly don't have time for that, but I do want to say just one uh, last thing here, that uh, I lost things. Uh, namely, there is a series that Ramanujan didn't know, and I'm going to put it on the Okay, uh, so, so don't get too afraid of this. All I want to tell you is that there are certain series that were discovered by L.J. Rogers and Nathan Fine, and almost certainly Ramanujan knew, but he never wrote down, because all of the three formulas that I showed you originally are special cases of this, and indeed one can explain that thing that should be a geometric series but is really odd. And you can find a few other formulas <coughs> that are related to things Gauss discovered. But the real question is, Ramanujan miss anything that was really new? So let us look at some of the Fs with small coefficients. So here is one of the Fs <coughs> that you passed by you on the screen, which the coefficients are small, but they are not all that small. But interestingly enough, you can rearrange this, and then all sorts of <coughs> things are clear. Namely, the series you just saw on the screen can be rewritten in a way that now makes absolutely clear what's going on. These are the increasing triangular numbers, and quite clearly these polynomials in Q inverse are 1 plus q to the 1, q to the 4, 1, 4, 9. Obviously, after another line like that, there will be 1, 4, 9, 16. And this has very interesting implications in uh, the theory of numbers. So there are a number of things that he missed that one can actually gain by a careful examination of the sorts of things he was looking at, and often with computer studies. So one of the things that he did not have available is this. He did not have any computer algebra package. And so that, um, 
that at, at least gives mere or mortals a shot at finding things that he missed. And there, the one should put it this way, that the, the foundations that Ramanujan laid have blossomed into a variety of studies and a variety of applications. And so while one can view the tragic aspects of his life, where he died at such an early age, nonetheless, the impact that he's had on mathematics and on mathematics into active mathematics in the 23rd century, 21st century, is just spectacular and is something that is a treasure that all of us can cherish and I especially cherish it. So thank you very much. <laughs>
the generating function for the crank, which was discovered 40 years after Dyson's paper, the generating function for the crank is there as well with the necessary uh, formulas in order to treat 11N plus 6. So this is, this is not atypical. There are, of course, formulas where we sort of feel like you just wrestle it to the floor until you finally beat it, until it doesn't move anymore, and then, then, and then you say QED. And you really don't have any insight into those. I would hate to say, well, those formulas are probably worthless. I would more likely say I'm just not smart enough to see what the implications of them are. But almost all of them have something in them that is surprising and, uh, and gives the unique quality of the mathematics of this man. Yes? Do you know the story of how the notebook ended up in the library? So, uh, so it's all speculation, uh, but I will, I will provide a plausible round of it. So it, 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 there, is, there is evidence that this, the following is true. His, when he died, his widow gathered up the papers that he had, which presumably includes his lost notebook, and sent them to the University of Madras. In the mid-1920s, it appears that these were then sent to G.H. Hardy, but by the mid-1920s, Hardy was heavily involved in his collaborations with Littlewood, so he did what many of us do when we get something interesting in the mail that isn't exactly related to what we're doing at the moment. We <laughs> file it under urgent, and it stayed there until Hardy died in 1939, <laughs> which I, it is reasonable to believe that since G.N. Watson, the contemporary, who lived much longer than Hardy, but more or less was his contemporary, Watson had done substantial work on, on Ramanujan's uh, uh, mathematics in the 20s and 30s, so these papers were passed to Watson. But during the Second World War, Watson's interests shifted away from this area of mathematics, and so he kept it. And eventually, when Watson died, his widow asked Rankin and Whitaker to please come and see if there was anything what would be worth saving. And Whitaker wrote a wonderful letter to me in which he said, I went upstairs and here was Watson's study with the floor covered to a depth of about a foot with a variety of mathematical and other papers. You might find something really interesting or you might find his income tax return for 1923. Fortunately, uh, Whitaker says, on one of these lucky dips I came up with this a manuscript of Ramanujan. But the disadvantage that everyone else in the world had is they did not know anything about the Mach Theta functions. And the Mach Theta functions are not named in this document. So it, only, the only way you can spot it is if you happen to know what they are. And so uh, that's, that's, prob that's a reasonable uh, route, but that is all uh, conjecture, really, as to the, the evidence points to it more than to anything else. Yes? Did you find any mistakes in the notebook? Yes, yes. There are three mistakes. <laughs> 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 it's not exactly fair. When I, I, I'm told that when I start to write on this board, people will scream at me, but they're not supposed to. Um, So there's one formula that he writes down where he has a You can use it, no, it's fine. It. It can okay. So there's, there's a certain continued fraction. And he says it's equal to 1 let's see, minus x plus x cubed minus x to the sixth plus dot dot dot. All right, so now is the fact that the next term is minus twice q to the eighth a mistake? because anybody at all will look at this line and say, well, these are the triangular numbers. And so he made a mistake. That isn't the triangular. But he didn't write the whole triangular number series. He only wrote that. So the fact that you're not smart enough to see that the next term is minus twice q to the a, that's your problem, not his. <laughs> there, is a, there, are, there are places where 
places where he puts two question marks after something. And so that suggests that he didn't think it was all that correct. And so and then there are, there are one or two formulas where he sort of left out an obvious infinite product, suggesting that he was making computations on the slate, which he often worked on, and just didn't copy it correctly. But there are not sort of glaring errors in it. As many of you know who know the story of his life, in his letter to Hardy, some of the things he sent were very wrong. He had what Hardy would call a very naive view of the distribution of prime numbers, but uh, he made no mistakes you know, on things he sent that were related to this sort of mathematics. And by the time he was in the last year of his life, he was truly one of the really powerful mathematicians in history working in this sort of mathematics. So it's not that surprising that the mistakes are rather small. Yes. So you've mentioned um, applications to number theory and yes. other areas. I mean, yes. there's perhaps, I wonder, like for instance, do you know if people have looked for topological or the characteristic explanations much? Uh, or is it? That I don't know. Because there might be know. areas that haven't looked at. I it. have, I have collaborated. So, so some of the mathematics in the Lost Notebook is very useful in describing how liquid helium distributes itself on a on a graphite plate. Uh, so there are very surprising applications of this in statistical physics. Uh, I read but do not know about the, the application of Mach theta functions to black holes, but there are people writing about that. It's just that I can't tell you uh, what, how, how much has been revealed about black holes because of Mach theta functions, but there are a variety of applications, and certainly a number of physicists are interested in them now, and they appear in a variety of physics papers. Uh, there, there have been statistics, others, this is mostly in statistical mechanics, but in other types of statistics there have also been applications, but uh, it won't surprise me that the fact that we are now coming to really understand the actual structure of the Mach theta function suggests that their application will probably uh, mushroom just the way the applications of the classical theta functions did. Okay, well, thank you very much.